Well, good evening. Good to see everybody tonight. Do you have a Bible tonight? I want you to open with me to the book of Exodus, if you will. We're going to the third division of the book of Exodus, and it will take us just a little while to get there tonight, but to get there, eventually we will. And while you're opening your Bible and getting settled, we welcome all of you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much for being here tonight. We know that, uh, know that most of you live very busy lives today. I would imagine that most of you worked hard today or you went to school and got home in time to grab a bite of food and then make your way to the building tonight. And we appreciate you making that effort to be with us. If you're busy with this church family, as I am tonight, welcome. We are so glad that you have come our way. You encourage us greatly in what we're trying to do at this place this week. And so we thank you for that. We hope you'll have occasion to come and worship with this good church family again very, very soon. You know, I mentioned yesterday that I lived in this area for <clears throat> several years. And one of the great things about coming back to this area is that I see so many brethren that I that I have known and met in the various churches that uh, surround the Indianapolis area and then a little bit north and a little bit south as well. And we have folks from everywhere who are here tonight. And I want to tell you how much I appreciate the fact that you are here with us. There are people in this audience tonight that, uh, that I love very, very much that are, uh, for me, closer than a brother. And so I appreciate all of you being here tonight very much. I enjoyed yesterday immensely. I, can hardly express to you how much I enjoyed being with you in both of our services and the gathering yesterday. That was just great fun. I enjoyed that very much. I, I've enjoyed getting to meet Lanny. I, I don't know if I'd ever met Lanny before. Had I, I don't believe so. <clears throat> the first thing is, he just looks disgustingly distinguished, doesn't he? With that, <laughs> with that beard and that his hair just flows back and it's thick and everything. And then I'm sitting there in front of him and the guy can sing like nobody's business. I'm listening to him sing. And he's got a wonderful voice. A wonder I cannot sing at all. I, I, now, I love to sing. I really do. I have been at Temple Terrace for 25 years, and I have asked them for 25 years to please let me lead singing one time. And they never have. Not one time. Not one time. But I do believe that they are about to relent. In fact, I think, if I, if I heard correctly, they are going to let me sing a solo of the old rugged cross. I believe that's right. Because I heard one of the elders say, we're only going to let Don sing on a hill far away. And so that's kind of, <clears throat> that's the way I took that anyway. Now maybe, maybe I'm mistaken about that. But it's so good to have you all with us tonight. We're glad. We are glad that you are here. Have you ever been in a circumstance, ladies and gentlemen, where you wondered, is this ever going to be over? Maybe you felt that way about high school. Maybe you felt that way about college. Maybe, maybe you've been in the middle of a root canal and just wondered, is this ever, is this ever going to end? I will tell you that I felt that way when my wife, Vicki, forced me to sit down and watch a double feature of fried green tomatoes and the notebook in one setting. Is this ever going to be over? I will tell you, preachers sometimes feel that way in gospel meetings. Now, I don't feel that way this week. I want to be very clear about that. But I did come home from a gospel meeting once, and Vicki, my wife, said, how was it? And I said, well, it was like this. If they ever tell me that I have six weeks to live, that's where I want to go, because six weeks there would feel like a lifetime. And so <clears throat> maybe, maybe you felt that at some time as well. Hospital rooms, funeral homes are often settings where we wonder, will this ever end? Well, Israel no doubt wondered about that as well because it had been four centuries, 400 years, and they wondered, where is God? God had promised to deliver, and God had promised to deliver Ur, and yet neither of those had taken place. In fact, things seemed to be getting worse and not better. Does that sound familiar, ladies and gentlemen? Can you relate to that in some way? We often seem to be living in a world that is, is spiraling in many ways out of control from the countless wars that saturate the soil of this earth with the blood of young men and women to, to ungodliness, unspeakable, unimaginable ungodliness that had been often sanctioned by the highest court in our land. And yet the message of Scripture is that our God is a sovereign God, that He is, to use the words of Paul, He is above all and through all and in all. We sing the song in our fellowship, don't we? The great non-Alexander song that says, There is none like Him, none can compare. There is no God is equal, no, no prince is heir. And we believe that. We believe that there is not a prince, a prime minister, a president, that there is no one with equal authority or power to our God. We teach our children to sing that He's got the whole world in His hands. And so it was the psalmist who said, The Lord reigns, let the people tremble. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, there, there is not a single maverick molecule that is not under the control of God. 
That is one of the very first things that is affirmed in Scripture and one of the very last truths to be acknowledged by men. And yet again, Paul would say, look, there is one God and Father of all, and He is above all and through all and in all. He is above or over all. He is the sovereign ruler of all creation. He is through all. That is, He sustains everything by the word, the word of His power. And He is in all, as Jeremiah would say in 4 and 20 of his writing, You are among us, O Lord, and we bear Your name, and so do not do not forsake us. And so again, there is not a single maverick molecule not under His control. And again, it is the first truth affirmed by Scripture and the last acknowledged by man. It seems that men will allow God to be almost anywhere except on His throne. And it's not that men don't believe in God. I mean, I will tell you that atheists are an aberration in every, in every society. I will, yes, there are some, but they are always an oddity. They are never the rule. They are never the majority. It's not that men don't believe in the existence of God. It's just that they don't want to give God His due place and His due power. In fact, I think probably what most individuals want in the world today is, <clears throat> is kind of a jack-in-the-box God. A God who will, who will just kind of pop up when there's a need, a crisis that we really feel like we can't take care of ourselves. But when the crisis is over and it's been averted because God swooped in and did what God is supposed to do, then we want God, we want Him back in the box, on a shelf, we want Him out of sight and out of mind, and more than anything else, we want Him out of the way. There is a misperception, ladies and gentlemen, that somehow you can have God as your Savior someday but not as your sovereign every day. Let me say that again. There's a misperception that somehow you can have God as your Savior someday, but not as your sovereign every day. Now, to justify that mindset, usually individuals will ask the where was God question. And so sometimes they're asked about situations in the Bible. So where was God? Where was God when Abel followed his brother into the field and only Cain returned? Where was God then? Where was God when Job was afflicted and Antipas was martyred? Where, where was God? Where was God when Herod was killing the babies of Judea? Where was God when hatred hurled rocks and crushed the life out of Stephen? Where was God? When Paul was capsized in the ocean and struggling to survive, where was God when his son Jesus was nailed to a cross? Where was your God then? And when they segue away from the Bible to modern time, the questions continue. Where was God? Where was God on the Tuesday morning of 9-11 when 3,000 individuals died and 6,000 children lost a parent? And where was God in the years that have intervened where war has ravaged our world because of that day? Where was God then? Where was God when, <clears throat> when schools began to have shootings from Columbine to Newtown to most recently in St. Louis? Where, where is God then? And where is God when tornadoes destroy and hurricanes ravage and fires burn and floods destroy? And where was God when ISIS rose and the innocent fell? And where was God when this nation was saving the whale while aborting our babies? And where was God when we were legalizing the immoral and marginalizing the righteous? Where was your God then? And I would answer, ladies and gentlemen, say that God was where He has always been. That God was, God was on His throne in heaven. I will tell you the answer to those questions, where is God? The answer is not Calvinism that argues that God predestined and ordained everything that happens without, in minute detail, whether good or bad. And at the other extreme, the answer is not deism that says that God created the world and gave it a good spin and then simply sat down in a corner of heaven and really doesn't care what happens to us at all. Neither of those are the answer. The answer is in the throne scene of Revelation chapter 4 where the very first thing that John in the Apocalypse is allowed to see, when the curtain of the drama of redemption is drawn back, the very first thing that he sees is that God is not run in the face of adversity. That God, ladies and gentlemen, still is. God is still Yahweh Sabaoth. That is, He is the Lord of hosts. More literally, He is the Lord of the hosts of heaven. And the hosts of angel heaven, of course, are that angelic host. Hebrews 1 still says that angels are ministering spirits that are sent forth by God to minister to those of us who are the heirs of salvation. That's where God is. God is sovereign and superintending this world and using the angelic force on behalf of those of us who are His children. And God wants us to understand something about that. God lets us know that He is Yahweh Sebaoth. 
That's only one, ladies and gentlemen, of many names that God reveals himself to us by. And so God, for example, the very first name by which he reveals himself in the Bible is Elohim, that in the beginning God created, and so he is the God. He is the God of creation, and he is also El Shaddai. That is, he is, <clears throat> he is the God Almighty. He is anything too hard for God? And it's a rhetorical question, of course, because he is El Shaddai, because he is the Lord God Almighty. Nothing is too hard for him. He is also Yahweh Nasi. And that is, the Lord is my banner. He is the God of victory. And He is Jehovah Makkah. That is, He is the God who strikes the blow. In other words, He is the God of judgment, where every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Because He is going to call into judgment every one of His human creation. And He is Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. And that is, He is the Lord of provision. The Lord will always provide for His children. And He is Yahweh Rapha. That is, He is the God who heals, the Lord who heals you. He is a God of compassion. And then finally, He is Jehovah Shema. He is the God who is there, the Lord who is present with His people always. In other words, again, as Paul would say, He is above all and through all and in all. Ladies and gentlemen, don't miss that about God that you and I are privileged to know the names of God because God decided to reveal them to us. And when God did that, He was trying to say to you and to me, I want you to know something about me, about who I am, about my character, about the fact that I am all of these things, and ultimately I am the God who will be with you. Now those things, I believe, are designed by God to, <clears throat> to teach us at least two or three very important things. I think, number one, that God is saying in the revelation of those names, look, I rule however I please. In other words, God is saying, because I am all of these things, I rule. And I don't need your permission. I don't need even your understanding. I will rule however I please. Listen to what God says about that. He is our God in heaven. He does whatever He pleases. Psalm 1, chapter 30, or 135. The Lord does whatever pleases Him in the heavens. And on earth. Isaiah talked about that once and he said, Who are you to reply against God? Shall the thing formed say unto him that formed it, Why have you made me thus? That's a great question, isn't it? God says, look, I rule however I please. And so who are you to reply against me? If you want to see a vivid illustration of that, just think about Job. Think about Job in all of those chapters where he just tiptoed up to the very edge of the canyon of blasphemy. And, and he would say, you know what, if I could just have five minutes with God, I would demand of him, Job says, and he would answer me. And he goes on and on and on. And he is right at the brink of blasphemy. And finally God interrupts and he says, stop, enough. And he asked Job, a series of some 56 questions. And if you boil it down and extract the essence, God is saying to Job, I tell you what, Job, when you can create a universe by the voice, by merely the, the power of your voice, and when you can sustain a universe by the upholding of your hand, when you can create a human being from the dust of the ground, then you come and see me and we will talk. But until then, God says, I will rule. I'll rule however however I please. And so when you read your Bible, that's what God does. Now, sometimes God will manifest His sovereignty in mighty and powerful kind of ways. And so you think about what He did with Pharaoh when He rains down those plagues, or you think about Nebuchadnezzar, who is the most powerful individual on the planet, and he is reduced by God to be an, an animal in the field. And sometimes God shows His sovereignty in very subtle ways, His providence in almost quiet ways. And so you think about Joseph or Ruth or Queen Esther. The point of it is that God will rule this world however He chooses. And so nobody, nobody tells God how or when or why He must act. Again, as Isaiah would say, God says, I, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, and what is still to come. And so God says, I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do what I please. And so He says, I rule however I please. Secondly, I think God is saying in those names, I rule whomever I choose. I rule whomever I choose. Don't miss this, ladies and gentlemen. God is never in the hands of men. Men are always in the hands of God. Look at this passage with me out of Proverbs 21. The king's heart 
is in the hand of the Lord. And like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Think about what that means. That means, ladies and gentlemen, that, that God is not only mightier than the mightiest of men, but it means that he gives mighty men their might. That he stands at the apex of all of that. That's why Jesus could say in John 19, and beginning in verse 11, you could have no power at all over me unless it had been given to you from above. And so God rules whomever he chooses. And then third, God says, I rule whatever man does. I do right ever rule whatever man does. Does God ever leave his throne? You ever thought about that? Is there ever a time when God abdicates his throne and just gets tired of ruling the world and decides that he'll take a break, maybe go, go to Starbucks, get a cup of coffee, and then come back and pick up later? Maybe it's like, Maybe it's like Rabbi Kushner, his best-selling book, when he asked, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, when that happens, is it because God has somehow abdicated his sovereign rule, at least for a time? Well, of course not. And so that brings us tonight to Exodus 3. You thought I forgot about that, didn't you? <clears throat> I want us to read together a little bit in Exodus 3. Now, you are wonderful Bible students, and so you know. You know the story of Exodus chapter 3. We began with saying that for 400 years, Israel <clears throat> was looking for a deliverer. Well, now God is about to do exactly what he has promised. And so he's going to choose Moses. And Moses is an interesting case study because the first 80 years of his life have not turned out at all as he thought they would be. But all oh, this last quarter of his life, a third of his life, is going to be an adventure and so in Exodus 3, and beginning in verse 1, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Oreb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why? This bush does not burn. And so when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God, <clears throat> God called to Moses from the midst of the bush, and he said to him, Moses, Moses, Moses said, here I am. And he said, do not draw near to this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Let's stop there for just a second. I, I've got to tell you that every time I read that, that thought fascinates me. What's, what's going on there? Why was that holy ground? I mean, there was no synagogue built next door to it. Why was that holy ground? Well, we say because the presence of God was there. Well, why then did God tell Moses to take off his sandals? Because that would be antithetical to Jewish thought. I mean, Jews in Moses' day and still today, in 2019, for example, in synagogue on a Sabbath day, when modern-day Jews are going to handle the Torah scroll, what do they put on their hands? They put gloves on their hands. Why? Well, because they don't believe that human hands can touch what is holy. And so if you're going to touch what is holy, you've got to have a barrier between the holy and sinful human beings. And so you need something on your hand. Jews have always thought that way. But God says to Moses, I want you to take your shoes off because this is holy ground. Why did God say that? I wonder if God really is insane. I wonder if the thought there really is that, Moses, I want you to take your shoes off because this is holy ground and I don't want there to be anything between you and me in my holy presence. I want us to have fellowship. I want us to be joined together here as one. I don't want there to be any separation. Take your shoes off so that we can be one in what is holy. And so you know the story that commences with that conversation. And God says, I choose you, and I want you to deliver my people. And Moses, of course, as you know, he is going to, he's going to have something to say. But now drop down to verse 13. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel, and I say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, <clears throat> I am who I am. And he said, Thus shall you say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus shall you say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, 
has sent me to you. And this is my name forever. And this is my memorial to all generations. Let's stop right there for just a moment, ladies and gentlemen, if we may. This is an amazing passage, and we don't, we don't talk about this very much, but I want us to talk about it for just a moment tonight. God says, look, this is my name forever. I give this name to you as a memorial for all, for all generations. And so he commands that there be some recognition here of his name. In fact, this name is so important to God that it appears in your Bible 8,623 times. I am that I am. 8,623 times that name is in your Bible. And you, I know you're saying, well, Don, I, I don't remember seeing I am that many times in my Bible. Well, that's right, because you don't. It's been, <clears throat> it's been interpreted different ways. I wish, I wish tonight I could tell you how the name was pronounced. But unfortunately, I can't. I can tell you that the, the equivalent English letters of the Hebrew would be Y-H-W-H. But, as you know, because you've heard this before in sermons and Bible classes, the, the Jews so revered his name that they stopped pronouncing it, even though God said, this is my, my name for all generations. They, they, they felt it was too holy to try, to try to pronounce or to use, and so they stopped. Well, later it was that they began to substitute words like Elohim or the, the word for Lord, Adoniah, and the rabbis would take the vowels from Adoniah, and they would, they would incorporate it with Y-H-W-H, and we typically have the word Jehovah, although almost all modern scholarship will use the word Yahweh. But on our English Bibles, those words are seldom used. And so most often what you will find in your English Bible is the word Lord in all capital letters. And you will find it literally thousands of times. But what that is saying is the name, the covenant name of God that he gave in Exodus 3. It is I am. I am is what God, is what God is saying. And so in Psalm 8 and beginning of verse 1, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all of the earth. And your name reflects your glory that is set in the heavens, but more literally it would be, O Jehovah our Lord, or O I am our Lord. That's what the voice from the flame said. I am who I am, and this is my name forever. And don't miss this, ladies and gentlemen, that this is the personal name of God that describes the indescribable, namely that God inhabits eternity. He is I am. Not I was or I will be, but simply I am. I don't just possess life, God says. I don't just dispense life. He is life. He is above all and through all and in all. I think in that, ladies and gentlemen, there are some compelling revelations. I think God, again, is trying in that name to say something to us. And so I think he's trying to say, look, Yahweh, I am Jehovah, means that, that God always is. That he possesses life in himself. As we read a moment ago, he is without beginning of years or end of days. God doesn't have a made in America tag on his collar. He is eternal. It is what the word literally means. In Psalm 90, in beginning of verse 12, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may in inhabit a heart of wisdom. But God can't do that. Again, he is without beginning of years or end of days. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, I'm never very impressed, never very impressed when men want to rail against the veracity of God, the power of God, the sovereignty of God, when a human being wants to rail against an eternal God. Again, God said to Job, look, when you, when you can fasten the mountains through the depth of the sea, when you can take and by your voice create a human being from the dust of the ground, then come and see me and we will talk. But he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He possesses eternity. Everything, listen to me carefully, everything that is, is, because God is. And so he said, I am. I am that I am. And secondly, Yahweh means that God never changes. It means that God does not change. You remember what was said about Jesus in the, <clears throat> in the book of Hebrews? That he is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Well, that was said about Jesus because he is made in the similitude and likeness of his Father. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. 
And so it's axiomatic that that would certainly be true of God as well. And when God says, I am that I am, he's saying that he never changes. What, what does that mean to us? Why is that relevant to us? Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is relevant to us because it means that when I am, when Jehovah, when Yahweh makes a promise to us, you can consider that promise a possession. And that's what gives meaning to a passage like 1 John 5. And so when John wrote in 1 John chapter 5 and beginning in verse 13, and he said, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life, and this life is in the Son. The reason that we can have confidence in that, assurance in that, is because God said that and God doesn't change. I am that I am. And so he said, I have written these things so that you may, listen to it, you may know that you have, not, not just that maybe, perhaps, someday, possibly, there may be a chance that you may be able to sneak in the back door of heaven someday, maybe. That isn't what he said. I want you to know this. I would hear a great sermon about that. Listen to my friend Roger and what he preached yesterday at Charleston Road. Great sermon about blessed assurance. Not as good as if I had preached it, but pretty good, i got to tell you. <laughs> but the reason that promise of God has teeth, the reason that promise of God, the reason Paul could say, there is laid up for me a crown of life which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me in that day. And, by the way, not to me only, but to all of those who look forward and love is appearing, is because God is I am. Because he doesn't change. And so Yahweh means that God never changes. And then third, I think all of that is designed to bring us some very comforting realizations. Now here's what I mean by that, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that the name of the Lord is a strong and mighty tower. And those who run, those who are his who run to it shall be safe. And God says, I am that I am. And this is my name for all generations. And I give this to you, he said, as a memorial for this time and to come. Could it be, ladies and gentlemen, that one of the reasons why sometimes that we are fearful or our faith is insipid, could it be sometimes it's because we've not used the name of God that he told us to use? This is my name for all generations, he says. Could it be that sometimes, I, I'm not indicting you, but I'm just asking, think about this. Could it be that sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, we have worshipped he was or he will be instead of I am? Could it be that we have put our faith in what we sometimes sing, to God be the glory, great things He hath? What is it? He has done in the past. And God says, look, I am that I am. Do you believe that? When we believe that, I believe that there are at least three very comforting realizations that come from that. Let me share them with you quickly in the lesson yours. Here they are. Number one, if He is I am, if he is I am, then where is the place that he does not reign? If he is I am, where is the place that he does not reign? When God said to Moses, look, you go tell Pharaoh, you go tell Pharaoh that I am has sent you. In other words, he is saying, look, you tell Pharaoh that I am not some local deity that is infringing on his church. You make Pharaoh understand that, that the earth is mine. Psalm 24, beginning to verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all that therein is. I mean, if God is before every place and after every place, then it means that God is over every place, and that should give us some comfort. And so let me ask you tonight, what is your Egypt? What is your Egypt? What is it in your life that your God is not sovereign over? If He is the great I Am, then what is it? What is it that He cannot help you with? Let me ask you tonight. What is the situation in your life that has gone on so long that you've decided it's never going to be over? That this circumstance, this situation in your life, that this is the one thing in your life that God is not ever going to do anything about. What is your Egypt? Has anything in your life lasted 400 years where you wonder, where is the God who made this promise to me? How about you tonight? Maybe you came in this building tonight. And you, like Israel of old, are in your own personal Egypt. Maybe, <clears throat> maybe you're enslaved tonight. 
Maybe tonight you came to this building and you're enslaved to a habit that is destroying you. Maybe you're enslaved to an addiction that is absolutely destroying your life. Maybe you're enslaved to a relationship that is abysmal. Maybe you came to this building and you were enslaved in a destructive behavior that is hurting yourself and those who love you. Maybe you came to this building tonight and you're enslaved to an attitude or a thought or a word that degrades you. You need to hear God Almighty say, I am. And whatever your Egypt is, God says, look, that's my turf. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In the world and all that therein is. If he is I am, where is the place that he does not reign? Secondly, if he is I am, who's able to frustrate his purposes? I mean, if, God, if he is I am, then, then who is the human being who is able to frustrate his purposes? Maybe we should phrase that this way. What throne always is except the one where the great I am reigns. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, what, <clears throat> what little clod of human dust that comes and goes is ever going to be able to stand against the God, the I am, who always is and was and will be, the one who is above all and through all and in all, and be able to succeed? So let me ask you tonight, who's your Pharaoh? Who's your Pharaoh? Who is the person in your life that, that, that is going to ever be able to successfully thwart whatever God's plan is for you. You know, God said in the book of Jeremiah, and, and I understand, and, and we need to be careful, I understand that there is a context here, and so let me acknowledge that from the very beginning, but if we can just take this statement in its largest sense, when God says, look, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you and give you future and a hope, and again, I know there's a context there, but Again, if we just take that in the largest sense, if we listen to David say in the 139th Psalm, when, when, I, was, when I was being formed in my mother's womb before anybody knew that, that she was even expecting, expecting me as a child, he said, you knew me, and I was complete in your sight. What human being is ever going to be able to thwart the plans that that God could have for you? And so, ladies and gentlemen, if I could give you some advice tonight, please don't ever let anyone who once wasn't and soon will not be, ever take your eyes off of the great I am. And third, if he is I am, what is the provision, what is the need that you have that he cannot meet? You know, from our perspective, when we pray to God and we say, God, I, <clears throat> I believe, I believe that this is what I need, and I'm asking you to meet this need. I'm asking you to help me with this. From our perspective, God's provision for us is always in the future. God, I'm asking you to do this, and so we're asking God in the future to help us. But I think from God's perspective, from heaven's perspective, his provision is always in the present because he is I am. And so let me ask you, what is your need tonight? What is the need that you have tonight that a sovereign God of heaven and earth along with his son, Jesus Christ, who, by the way, shares that I am nature, what is the need that they cannot provide? In fact, let me just segue out of that for just a minute and, talk, and say a word about that. You remember, being the good Bible student you are, that when Jesus was on the earth, he appropriated that I am name for himself. And so he would say things like, I am the good shepherd, and I am the great physician, and I am the, <clears throat> I am the bread of life, and I am the light of the world, and I am the resurrection and the life. And so let's put that together tonight. If the great I am, who is the ruler of this world, and his son, Jesus Christ, who shares that I am nature with him, if they work in conjunction with each other on behalf of we who are the children of God, there is one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. If they work in conjunction with each other, what is the need, ladies and gentlemen, that they cannot meet? What did Paul say in Romans 8? If God is for us, who then can be against us? Let me ask you tonight. What does it mean when God says, don't take my name in vain? Don't, don't take my name in vain. What, what does that mean to you? Well, we say, well, Don, that, <clears throat> that would mean that we don't use God's name in a 
disrespectful way. We don't use it in a blasphemous way. We would not use it in a way that would denigrate who he is. That's certainly true. There is no doubt about that. But could it also be, ladies and gentlemen, that we take his name in vain when we don't remember the very name by which God said, I want to be known? Because he said, I am who I am. Tell him that I am has sent you. Because, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me very carefully before we stop tonight. I am is always the answer. I am the answer, God says. And so when my life falls apart, who's, who's going to stand with me? And God says, I am. And who's going to make sure that the whole world knows about Jesus? And God says, I am. Who's going to make sure that truth will one day prevail over evil? I am. Oh God, I can't do life on my own. I, I need someone to help me. I am. Who's smart enough to figure this out? I am. What if my family falls apart? Who, who's going to take care of me then? I am. What if the chemo is not enough? I am. What if the surgery is not a success? I am. Well, who's going to stay with me in this house now that my maid is gone? I am. Who's going to lift me out of this pit of despair? I am. Oh, God, I need something desperately new and fresh in my life. I am. God, the world seems to be crumbling at the seams. What's going to last? I am. No one's listening to me. I am. Nobody cares about me. I am. Nobody's on my side. I am. My family deserves better than I've given them. I am. Who's going to make sense of this world and give my life meaning? And God says, I am. And I always have been. And I always will be. And this is my name. Forever. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have never bowed your knee before the great I am and been buried in the water of baptism so that you could rise to be his child and walk in newness of life, or if you've come to that name and bowed your knee and been buried in baptism, but have used his name in vain by virtue of the life that you've lived and not acknowledging that he is the God, the sovereign God of your life and soul, and you need to come home to him tonight. This invitation, this invitation is for you. Let's stand and let's sing tonight.